hot soup. <laughs> He's like, that's like the cousin on, a, on like a country yeah. sitcom. Hot soup. <laughs> and he just loves hot soup. It's like. <laughs> what is that when, they, when soups are cold? That's like a different. Uh, there's a couple, right? Well, yeah. Like borscht is cold. <laughs> <laughs> That's their, then, like, Soviet cousin. Yeah, concept. what is a cold soup? Gazpacho. Gazpacho. Right. Nice. <laughs> That's a character who comes in for an episode. He's, like, their uh, cousin from, like, <laughs> like Italy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His name's Gazpacho. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I only like a cold soup. I'm like, what? <laughs> I guess I, I guess I could do a cucumber gazpacho, but I do prefer hot soup. Oh, hot <laughs> soup. <laughs> Freeze frame, roll credits. Hello, <laughs> and welcome back to the... Should we talk about cars now? <laughs> yeah, let's do that. Welcome back to the Past Gas Podcast from Donut Media. I'm your host, James Pumphrey. And I am Nolan Sykes. Uh, today, we have... Oh, I'm excited about uh, this. Yeah, one. this is a good one. This this is like one of the coolest car things ever. Yeah. We have a very It's so secretive. Cool topic for you guys today. We are talking about a racing group <laughs> known as the Midnight Club. The Midnight Club. Yes. The fastest racing team, fastest street racing team in Japan. They got a comic yeah. book made after them. Yeah. Thanks to an in-depth investigation by our wonderful writer, Joseph. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, we're able to bring you the truth about the Midnight Club. Uh, it's worth pointing out that most of the articles you find on the Midnight Club are based on the Wikipedia article. <laughs> That's it. That's journalism, man. Yeah. Unfortunately, for the vast majority of them, the information on the Wikipedia page has been purposely crafted to mislead people to protect the real members' identities. Oh, my God. They're the Illuminati. It's insane. That means a large amount of what people think they know about the club is actually l- wrong, deliberately so. But fret not, because uh, we're we're super excited to share the real story behind the Midnight Club. This will be a two-part series, okay? So uh, stick around next week for part two. Very special surprise in there. We may have been asked to deliver a message yeah. from the Midnight Club. Past Gas Podcast. All right, so to know the story of the Midnight Club, you have to know 1980s Japan. Throughout the 1980s, Japan was experiencing one of the most significant financial bubbles of all time. Uh, The entire bubble was similar to the one that we had in the U.S. in 2008 and the one that is currently taking place in China. The post-World War II economy of Japan had encouraged citizens to save their money causing an unbelievable surplus of savings. Uh, The banks had no problem meeting their reserve requirements thanks to the massive cash surplus, which in turn allowed the banks to engage in much more lenient lending behavior. Does this sound familiar? Yeah. Okay, good. There were also many... It's it's like America. Yeah. (laughs) It's like how it was 10 years ago. No, but that's a crash. What, What we're saying here is just like, after World War II, there was this culture in Japan... Where the government was like, just save your money, save your money, save your money. And the reason that these cars happened is because the companies looked around and they were like, oh, everyone's got a bunch of money. Yeah. We could, we could make something really cool stuff and they could buy it. Yeah. And so they just started making twin turbo six cylinder behemoths. Yeah. We will get there. Uh, There are also many government programs that intended to weaken the U.S. dollar against the Japanese yen through means of financial deregulation. Uh, The combination of excess liquidity in the banks and financial deregulation led to a massive economic boom known as Japan's economic miracle. Prices on domestic stocks and real estate had risen to an all-time high, tripling in value, tripling, tripling in value between 1985 and In 1989, wealthy parents could afford to buy their children the nicest sports cars Japan had to offer. Sports cars were absolutely everywhere in 1980s Japan. The best of all, they were dirt cheap. A new Nissan Silvia S13Q only cost roughly 7,500 US dollars, which is about $18,000 today. Can you imagine getting a Sylvia that much? <laughs> yeah. You can't, like... You can't get a Sylvia for 18 grand. I mean, you can. You could, but, like, a clean one. 
Yeah. That's what they're they sell for now. Yeah, they haven't depreciated at all. Uh, in the big picture, it was the Japanese bubble that led to the birth of all the street racing in the country. I am hooked. Kids loved the idea of driving a fast car on the cheap in the early 80s. Some of the more popular choices, of course, were the Celica Supras. They weren't the Mark IV Supras yet. They're the Celica Supras. Uh, AE86s, S30s, S130s, RX7s, Nissan Skylines, the Silvia again. Uh, and yeah, since they all had easy money from their parents, all they would do is dart onto the highway in Tomei or Wangan and start zipping around looking for trouble. The Tomei Highway became notorious for heavy-duty street racing. Uh, the racing was known as... Okay. This is uh, Japan. Probably going to butcher some of these words. So just Shutoku. Shutoku. Charcuterie. <laughs> racing was known as Shokudo or Roulette Zoku, but primarily called Shokutan. And it was incredibly dangerous, obviously. Uh, amateur racers were known uh, for getting in major accidents, for causing major accidents... Pretty much daily, and as the decade progressed, the highways became crowded with uh, just groups of amateur racers. At night, the highways were literally flooded with them. It's pretty dangerous, but also also sounds uh, kind of cool. That'd it sounds super cool. It'd be fun. One thousand percent. Yeah, nothing is cooler than rolling squad style. It doesn't happen very often to me because um, I'm in my Mustang, and when I see another Mustang, it's usually. Beat up, mm-hmm. but like we just built those two three fifty Zs. Going to talk about that, yeah. yeah. And like rolling next to you in a matching car is one of the coolest experiences. It's sick. On life. that show, if you haven't seen Watch Hilo yet, um, one night we had just upgraded the brakes and we were testing them and we were rolling down the main street and I saw another Nissan. Mm-hmm. I think it was an S thirteen, um, rolling along. It was orange and I was like, I saw him up ahead, maybe like quarter mile ahead. And I was rolling with Aaron Parker, uh, our friend and my mechanic. And he's like, yo, dude, go go get him. So we, like, sped up to him. And I was just cruising next to him. I was like, oh, man, this guy likes what I like. This yeah, is cool. Yeah, totally. I was going to uh, – we shot an episode of Bumper to Bumper yesterday, and I drove the Z. And uh, right when I got off the freeway, uh, G35, oh, yeah. like, pulled up next to me. And it was, like, this, like, Asian girl. And, like, she, like, revved. And then, like, I pulled. And she, it was like <laughs> – And she was like – yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. You're like dude. so stoked. That's so cool. Yeah. yeah, it's just so much it's so much fun. So this sounds fun, but dangerous. It is street mm-hmm. racing. Street yeah, don't racing street race. Is bad. <laughs> Many of the racers would try and form teams. The teams created at this time were filled with inexperienced drivers trying to make a name for themselves, hoping to win cash, attention, cars, gals, yeah, or boys. Yeah. Respect. Yeah. Family. That is a crazy idea that's like yeah dude i'm just gonna go out and like what if you went right now you're like i'm gonna hop in the 405 try to get me some sponsors (laughs) (laughs) as the decade went on there was a huge boom in unrestricted power kind of like what we're seeing right now with like dodge demon and like Mm -hmm. now supercars are making like over 900 close to a thousand horsepower like crazy Ironically, because of, like, um, efficiency standards, like, turbos are really helping. Turbos and superchargers are really helping cars make tons of power. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. Yeah. Kind of the same thing was going on in Japan. The boom reached its peak in February of 1989 when the naturally aspirated version of the Nissan 300ZX was unveiled at the Chicago Auto Show. During the reveal, the president of Nissan at the time boasted that it was the only base trim level sitting on the auto show floor, and it only had a little teensy 222 horsepower. Not bad for the late 80s. The top range model, the twin turbo Z32, was expected to pull anywhere from 300 to 320 horsepower, which was unheard of at the time. Um... Little note for the the kids out there. During the 1980s, cars were generally pretty slow. To get your hands on the quote-unquote good ones, you had to spend a pretty penny or two, okay, to get yourself in the seat of a high-end sports car such as a Ferrari. But Nissan was about to change all that. In 1989, 320 horsepower in a 300ZX of that size would be equivalent to, like, the 370Z of today having the same power as the Ferrari 488, I.e., nutso. Yeah. 
At the time, Ferrari had just introduced the 348, and it made roughly 300 horsepower and weighed almost the same as the 300ZX. The Ferrari was selling for over $120,000 new, the equivalent of about $230,000 today. Uh, and that's where Nissan truly had Ferrari beat. Nissan expected to mass produce the 320 horsepower 300 ZX and sell them for a little over $30,000, equivalent to about 60 grand today. That's like the C8 vet. Yeah. That's exactly, yeah, that's exactly it. Like giving the people that supercar performance. Right. It's like sort of like these companies are like, yeah, we can't do it for that cheap. And yeah. then someone shows up and they're like, yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. And all the consumers <laughs> are like, what? <laughs> Uh, everybody do it then. I think in the case of like, the, I mean, f- in the case of Ferrari, as we know from our previous episodes, now av- still available <laughs> on whatever platform you're listening to, um, the Ferrari name is what you pay for, right. really. Like, the performance is there, obviously. You could you could get that same performance elsewhere, but mm-hmm. like, there's just something about, there's that, that it's heritage. It's a Ferrari. It's a Ferrari, yeah. Yeah. So when the Japanese press caught wind of what Nissan had announced at the Chicago Auto Show, the Japanese government started cracking down on automakers almost immediately, okay? As soon as word reached Japan, a meeting of the minds and all the presidents of the company met together to have a serious discussion of the impact of such a car on Japanese streets and the country as a whole. The government was afraid of what a powerful car like that could do on the streets. By the way, 320 horsepower. <laughs> yeah. yeah <laughs> like now like Camrys having, make that much. Right, yeah. yeah. They're having a summit. That's so funny. <laughs> so came out freaking Focus RS. <laughs> <laughs> Japan was filled with a lot of narrow and windy roads that careened through densely populated Kuge. areas. Yes. But most importantly, there was already that abundance of street racing. Uh, the last thing they needed were cars that could match the Ferrari in terms of power on their streets. That was pretty scary. Like, it was already, like, a health hazard, public health hazard. Now mm. it's like, this Nissan is a health crisis. So the Japanese government decided that all companies would be prohibited from producing cars that exceeded 276 horsepower. That's but a common sense car law. Whoa. The limitation was designated to last only 15 years. During those 15 years, no cars were allowed to eclipse that horsepower mark in the home market within Japan. Important distinction, within the home market Mm -hmm. of Japan. Each car manufacturer signed a gentleman's agreement that would enforce these restrictions in Japan. The goal of the agreement was to limit accessibility of supercar power to kids whose rich parents would routinely purchase them the latest and greatest affordable sports car. They had already seen what these kids could do with 250 horsepower and were terrified of the consequences of giving them even more. These kids weren't afraid of taking their cars out onto the highway at night and pushing them to the limits, all while throwing caution to the wind. While the world may have viewed the 300ZX as a massive technological step towards high performance for the masses, the Japanese government was more concerned about safety. Uh, the twin turbo Z32 was the straw that broke the camel's back and made automakers realize that things, they were getting out of hand. But there was a way to get around the agreement. <laughs> Lots of companies. Lying. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of companies, Nissan included, installed restrictor plates in the engines to limit the power output. So while the car may have been sold to you with only 700 the 276 horsepower, you could remove this plate or reroute a few cables and tubes, and all of a sudden you were pushing over 330 horsepower. Of course, there were labels from the manufacturer saying, don't do this when it came to making those changes, but telling someone not to do something usually makes them want to do it more. A good example of this is one of our favorite cars, and if you're listening to this podcast, it's probably one of your favorite cars too, the R32 Skyline GTR, a.k.a. Godzilla. <laughs> Yeah, you know that Godzilla word? Yeah. <laughs> the R32 was redesigned in order to push the limits of each restriction set in place by Group A Racing, including a 2.6 liter twin turbo engine, all wheel drive, and all wheel steering. Ooh. This beast of a car was well into development by the time the company self imposed restrictions on power, and it obviously was capable of. Of more than 276 horsepower. So, Nissan decided to install a restrictor plate to limit power. Once removed, the R32 GTR suddenly found itself with another 60 to 70 horsepower at the wheels. 
The most interesting part of the gentleman's agreement was how it actually made independent companies want to push the rules even further. People wanted to buy sports cars even more now that they were restricted. People and companies alike would tune their cars to make as much power as possible just for the heck of it. This was still all taking place at the height of the Japanese bubble economy. People had more money than they knew what to do with, so they began funneling it into their cars to increase their performance as much as humanly possible. While the agreement certainly saved countless lives by preventing reckless amateur street racers from having access to overpowered race cars, it also massively stimulated the further growth of one of the coolest movements in automotive history, the tuning movement. The tuning movement was nothing new by 1989, the year that Taylor Swift was born. In fact, it had been around since the 1970s, but it was this agreement that sparked a massive rise in popularity for the movement. And here's the thing about kids. Despite all the money their, their parents may have, the kids are usually broke. So while their parents may provide a modest sports car for them, they're not going to give them money to make it faster. And they certainly aren't going to provide them with a Ferrari. But amateur racers still craved max speed. They wanted speed, and they wanted it cheap. Look, Mom, I want speed, and I want it cheap. <laughs> Are you tired of paying top dollar for speed? Yeah. <laughs> this put automotive tuning shops in a bit of a pickle. Uh, the shops had to develop components that were inexpensive, but reliable enough to be thrown on all these brand new sports cars that were basically being treated as disposable assets. Parts had to be reusable and transferable from one wrecked car to the next. Um, while shops were capable of designing these parts, the problem came, James, when they had to test them. This is where JAMA comes in. <laughs> J-A-M-A -A stands for the Japanese Automotive Manufacturing Association. They realized that the street racing boom may have hidden potential. Tuner shops were modifying the cars for efficiency and power with much fewer restrictions than on uh, Nissan or Toyota. They didn't have the same government oversight. Obviously, the tuners were doing some amazing things, and JAMA was ready to make some money off of it. JAMA. JAMA. Roll tad. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the Japanese government began to support the modification of performance cars by way of financial incentives. This is getting... A little weird. In their eyes, any insane modifications that could be used day to day that improved performance would attract foreign car buyers, aka us Americans. Yeah, yeah. Basically, any development that could be vaguely used in a consumer car to help compete against the American and European car market was incentivized by the Jap Japanese government, causing even further growth within the tuning movement itself. Yeah. So they made this law that said. You can't make your cars fast. Yeah. And then they paid people to develop ways to make, to make cars fast. <laughs> JAMA, most importantly, provided high-end tuning shops access to the Yatabe, a high-speed oval testing circuit that was used to develop these high-speed parts. The Yatabe offered shops a safe and stable test environment, but nothing could really simulate the real-life conditions these components were going to see. After all, uh, shuck, shuck a ton. shuck a ton racers were pushing their cars to the limit on the Wangan and Tome highways. The Atabe circuit was super smooth by comparison. It was a bank track with no other, with no traffic. Many small shops and engineering firms were capable of testing their products to their limit safely on the Atabe, but that wasn't enough. By the time the gentleman's agreement was formed, Atabe was already an epicenter of the tuning development world and would only gain further notoriety within the confines of Japan as the tuning movement really kicked off. Not long after testing by tuner shops was permitted at Yatabe in the late 70s, tuning shops began to test their products on the street. After all, only road testing could truly simulate the harsh vibrations and other variables of practical use. Separate shops began to group up as they would participate in testing together. One of the most notable groups born from this was the Midnight Club, <gasps> which was formerly created in 1983 but of course they were different than the other groups yes just to preface okay the name midnight club is not entirely accurate okay the name was most likely a mistranslation during a feature in an episode of jeremy clarkson's motor world the show that exposed the west 
the Midnight Club. Well, the Midnight Club is most commonly used by that name, uh, and there's even a video game with that name, one of my favorite games ever. I love Midnight Club 3. Uh, it's not the true name of the group. The true name of the Midnight Club is actually Racing Team Midnight. Or Midnight, for short. Not a club. It's not a club. It's a team, dude. It's, it's a, a team. racing team. Yeah. Not some... We're not some club. We're not freaking we don't have club. a tree house. We're not playing golf, you dorks. Yeah. We're driving 203 miles an hour on the freaking highway together. <laughs> All right? We're a team club. You know what? Get out of my face. We're not throwing a freaking charity dinner. <laughs> All right? We're not going freaking pep rallying. We're not a glee club. We're not cheering on the team. We are the team. Wow. You dumb dumb. Dork. <laughs> you wimp. You know who joins clubs? Wimps. You know who builds teams? Quarterbacks. Drivers. Race- <laughs> Racing Team Midnight began as a vessel for a large... <laughs> <laughs> Why did you say ooh? Did, did the word vessel make you horny? <laughs> Gross. Uh, Midnight members were not just amateurs looking for a quick buck or a good race. Mm-mm. They were professionals That's right. seeking to test their products, usually in the middle of the night. Hence the name. <laughs> hence the name. When there was the least amount of traffic and police presence on the highways. Unlike many other groups, the members of Midnight adhered to a strict set of rules when racing on the street. This code is probably what Midnight is most famous for, but there were even stricter rules and requirements to even get close to the team. To be considered for a role within Midnight, you had to be affiliated with the companies involved within Midnight somehow, whether it was in sales, marketing, design, engineering, or production of parts. You had to show that you were working to better Japan's automotive industry and ultimately the country as a whole. That's insane. So it's not even like... That's sick. It's not even like a thing like, yo, man. You want to go fast? Yeah. You rich and want to go fast? Yeah, it's like, are you making Japan better? Yeah. Um, are you? Uh, are, are you? No. Yes. <laughs> no, you're not allowed. God damn it. Midnight doesn't even exist. Uh, what? It's not real. Oh, no. I'm not even a person. What? I'm a coat. <laughs> <laughs> Furthermore, you had to have the skills that could work to the benefit of everyone involved. All the work that was done on the team cars was done in-house, and you had to be a you had to prove to be a worthwhile addition, okay? No no clowns allowed. Whether that was ECU reprogramming or simply welding. Welding mm. is hard. I'll if you knew how to weld, yeah. you wouldn't work here because you would make so much more money. That's true. <laughs> like if anyone, like the editors are different, but you and me, we don't know how to do anything. I we sh- literally yeah. have no skills. I'm trying to take pictures better. <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that's not. <laughs> that's a okay. That's just a little tip for anyone listening or watching. Um, learn how to do something. Learn how. Learn a useful skill like something like that. If college, if you don't think you want to go to college, that's fine. Go to a trade school. Learn how to do like. Uh, when I was at Cuesta Community College, I took one welding class. Uh, and I've forgotten everything from it, but like they had a whole program, and you could become a sick certified welder. Dudes make like fucking $100 an hour welding on big pipes. That's you know? insane. It's crazy. That's crazy. It's awesome. I spent 15 years yelling at people and then finally got paid for it. <laughs> um, yeah, and Questa didn't even have a course for yelling, yelling at people. At people. So, yeah. like, great. You should start one. Yeah. <laughs> Team Midnight members were instructed to be as diplomatic and responsible as possible. While, of course, the members would sometimes have fun and race strangers from time to time, the majority of the time, they refrained from racing other non-team members. The racing on the road was never referred to as racing, but as testing instead. That's so cool. That's so cool. <laughs> it's I'm, so cool. Oh, it's so cool. We're going to go test tonight. Oh, sick. I yeah. get to drive my car 200 miles yeah. an hour? Yeah, hell yeah. That's so no, sick. It's not fun. It's dude. not fun. We're this, testing. This is work. We are yeah. scientists, man. That's insane. It's, so, like, we were saying, like... We, <laughs> We haven't really said who was in the group because, like, one, I don't know. Mm-mm. 
Um, I've heard rumors. Yeah, lots of rumors. These are big execs in big companies. I'm not going to name any of these companies. Big execs, like big execs. Oh, yeah, I do know one that we heard yeah. from what I source. met him at SEMA. <laughs> That's insane. Yeah. yeah, and you're just like looking at him like, all right. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, oh, he's a big exec. He's not a big man. No, he's a little man. <laughs> yeah. But, but that's just the kind of... That's he's got why that this BDD. So cool. That's why this is so... Like, it, it sounds silly that they're not calling it racing and they're calling it testing mm-hmm. and everyone, there's all these rules. But, like, when you think about it, they're coming from, like, a corporate office environment. A corporate of office environment. And they have, like, a lot of say in yeah the things that they are testing. Testing came with its own set of guidelines that all members were required to follow no matter what. Drivers were forced to stay a minimum of one lane away from other traffic and would have to have their hazards on as if they were in the slow lane. Uh, so they're like, hey, we're going fast. Hey. Here are my hazards. Yeah. Look out. Um, they were also required to have super bright aftermarket headlights or even a bright paint job so the civilians could see them coming. Dude, this is so sick. <laughs> I'm getting a fucking... <laughs> I have such a crush. Yeah. <laughs> One member even started developing body kits for Porsches that added a second layer of high beams beneath the original ones, causing many of the cars used by the club to share very similar bumpers with the Porsche 935 so they could all run more high beams. Yeah. It's, like, so cool to be an outlaw and make yourself brighter. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, um, let's, we got to do this really illegal stuff but we don't want anyone to get hurt. Yeah. <laughs> so you better paint your car bright pink and you better put lights all over yeah, it. It's, it's like, oh, it's, yeah. so sick. it's like so cocky in such a fun way. It's so cool, man. Most importantly, they were to never conduct tests in moderate to heavy traffic. Uh, most other teams tended to drive recklessly or pursued max speed regardless of danger involved. Meanwhile, Midnight prided themselves on their concern for the safety of those around them because they're trying to make japan better and japan isn't better if the streets are dangerous yeah you know what i mean like the people that they're trying to protect the public people the reason they're putting these lights on those are the people that they're testing these cars for yeah, for the betterment of for right. the betterment of yeah it's yeah. so crazy since they were testing new and unheard of products everything under the hood of the car was to remain confidential yes! outside the team <laughs> one thing members never wanted to risk was a police presence. In fact, some members would have a hidden mechanism that flipped their license plate to hide their plates from cameras. Yes! James Bond, dude. James freaking Bond. A few would go so far as to wear helmets during races to avoid being identified. Have you ever driven around with a helmet on? Yeah, it's so so fun. (laughs) It's really fun. It's cool. Yeah, driving around on the street with a helmet is the most fun. It feels illegal for some reason, Uh even though you're safer. Yeah. It's weird. Well, yeah, the, the, the stairs you get are pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's so cool. Throughout our research, we noticed one of the most commonly repeated facts was the way that Team Midnight meets were organized. On the Wikipedia page, it is stated that meeting locations and times would be listed in the classified oh, yeah. section of a local Tokyo newspaper, and it would read something like this. <clears throat> or, go ahead. For sale. Small handbags at discount prices. For more information, I am available to meet at Daikoku Parking Area on Thursday between 11 p.m. and 2 a.m. Thank you. It feels like a spy story, hearing the locations of secret meetups written in code that only a select few would truly understand. So A select few, like handbag enthusiasts. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, I'd like to imagine the guy who's like, Hey, <laughs> what are all these cars doing here? I got my anniversary coming up, and I want to get my wife a nice purse at a reasonable price. At 11 p.m.? <laughs> yeah, I thought the timing was a little weird, but I thought the savings might make up for it. All right. That's I'm going to be in hot soup if <laughs> oh, I no, show up my soup. anniversary without any presents. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> Sadly, this whole story about the classified ads... It was, wasn't real? It's not real. Uh, it was meant to mislead people who were digging for the identities of the Team Midnight members. In reality, each member always knew where the next meet would be because they called each other. <laughs> oh, man. 
Um, meets were usually held in random parking garages, uh, not far from any entrance to the Tomei Highway. <laughs> yeah, it's like you think about that story, then like you hear it, and you're like, oh yeah, that's so cool. That that's exactly how they would do it. Yeah. And then you're like, oh yeah, phone. <laughs> yeah, it's 1980. <laughs> it's 1991. Yeah, for 80 years. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh yeah, right. That makes more sense. Yeah. <laughs> so all this anonymity. Kind of makes sense from a legal standpoint, but to really understand it, we need to take a look at how Japan truly views street racers and how it differs in views from our modern society. From our Western society, yeah. rather, sorry. Uh, Japan is a very conformist, uh, conformist country with a very simple and clear black and white view of what is right or wrong. Right is right and wrong is wrong. Huh. Uh, and they are incredibly strict about their rules. There are are no excuses for nonconformity. If you are a nonconformist, you are more or less outcast by society. Everything there is done as a team because they're on an island and mm-hmm. all of their cities are densely packed and they have all their systems have to work together. And in historically unison. forever, Japan was just like alone. Yeah. Like on purpose. Yeah. With just uh, different prefectures ruled by different, em- uh, not emperors, but like um, shoguns? Daddies. Daddies. Different daddies, different regions. They all had their own rules. Mm-hmm. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot more history to it. There's a lot of yeah. history. Actually, uh, there's a, the, what is it, internet historian? Bill Wurst. Yeah, he's got a great. With his history of Japan thing, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So good. Knock, you should knock. watch that on YouTube. It's the United States. Yeah, yeah. that kind of thing. It's so good. <laughs> Despite this, like, really strict view of conformity in Japan, they also value individualism. Like, you can be an individual kind of weirdo as long as you follow all the rules. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah, so that's okay. why you have, like, people with six-foot pompadours and right girls who dress up like bunny rabbits. Exactly. Day. So, like, you can do that, but as long as you don't uh, block the subway door. Yeah, don't block the subway door, but you can buy girls' underwear in a friggin' vending machine. Don't see anything wrong with that. <laughs> You can eat dinner under a glass table where a girl is sitting yeah. on her but Regardless of how cool or individualistic someone might be, there is still that expectation that you will respect your fellow man and show courtesy, honor, and respect. And in their culture, there is no room for street racing. Yeah, because it's like yeah. dangerous. It's putting the other people in danger. Totally. Uh, I like see. that, man. I'm into that. Yeah. Like, do whatever you want. That's right. Just don't f- it up. Like here in the script says, America thrives on outlaw culture. <laughs> yeah. It's just like we're, we have this like puritanical society in a way, but then all those dudes are, you know. Yeah. Weird. So it's exactly. So like we live in a somewhat yeah puritanical culture, but we also love the outlaw. It's like yeah. it, it's. We created yeah. a situation where we need an escape. Yes. And it's like just universally accepted in America that it's like. Yeah, this is, like, really hard. It's hard to keep up with this. So every once in a while, I'm going to go. I'm going to tune my truck and go, roll coal. Yeah. There we go, dude. <laughs> I, I win. Exactly. I'm going to get a Harley. Okay, so we love the bad guys. Uh, Bonnie and Clyde, they're viewed as he- heroes for mm-hmm. sticking it to the man. NASCAR, uh, that was literally born from breaking the law and running from cops. We love the Fast and Furious. But in Japan, there's no cool stigma around the Hashiyira. Hashiyira literally means street racers. But when Japanese people hear Hashiri, Hashiria, sorry, uh, they immediately think of the Bozuzoku. James. Door the police car. Bing, 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 bing. James really likes. I love the Suzuki's. Well, I'm about to ruin that for you. Okay, so they immediately think of the Bozuzoku because, in their eyes, the Hashiria and the Bozuzoku are one and the same. Bozuzoku, if you don't know, and if James's little bit there didn't clue you in, they're Typically juvenile kids on crazy bikes or loud cars causing mayhem and pandemonium. 
Japanese consider Bozozoku a menace to society. Uh, to be quite honest, and this was kind of hard to learn for me because I really like the Bozozoku too, they are considered the first step into the Yakuza and are heavily associated with the Japanese alt-right and neo-Nazi movement. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it! Uh, the people, James, the people are not the... <laughs> People hate the Bozizoku because they're freaking scary. They make a lot of noise, uh, redlining their bikes. They uh, hit baseball bats on the ground while yelling around. They disturb the peace. And um, they've been known to follow people home from work and women into alleyways to uh, commit crimes and sometimes murders. Turns out these guys suck. Yeah. <laughs> so while the Bozizoku styling is really cool, and unique, and we really love it. Um, the Bozuzuka themselves are usually um, just a bunch of ass. yeah. Well, I was just thinking. I was like, well, what if you could do something that's like just all the cool parts, but none of the bad parts? And that's literally what Club Mi or what Team Midnight is. Yeah, that's yeah. literally like they were like, here's all the cool stuff, but we're not going to be ass. yeah. Okay, guys, there's some rules to be on this team. Yeah. Yes, we do drive fast as f Yes, we do have very cool cars. Yes, sometimes we wear helmets while we drive on roads. <laughs> yeah. Like, that's kind of nerdy. <laughs> it's, yeah. Um, you know what we don't do? We don't act like f And if you act like an a you're out. You're out. Yeah, man. I love the min Team Midnight. Team Midnight. Turns out awesome. I hate Bo Suzoku. Yeah, All right. Dude, I, mean, I, I just, I'm going to go out on a limb here. Yeah. I can hate Nazis, all right? And Donut, I, I'm speaking for Donut, yeah. we hate Nazis. Yeah. If you're a racist piece of shit, stop watching our stuff. Just I'd say people, I'd man. say in general, if you're lonely, um, you don't have to be. Yeah. And there's ways to not do it. And if anything, Nolan and I are here for you. Don't start hating people because you're a lonely person. There you go. There you go. Wow. Feel good. Yeah, ruined Bo Suzoku for me. Yeah, sorry, man. Okay, Beep. so <laughs> Beep. if you're a street racer in Japan, you understand what pe how people perceive street racers yes. in Japan, yes. and you don't want people to know that you are a street racer in Japan. Right, because like we just mentioned, like the street racing is seen. It's not cool. It's not. It's not yeah. romantic. Yeah, like, right. The general right. public doesn't see it as like, oh wow, because these guys, like we said, are. Very successful people. Yeah. Um, they have high-level positions in brands that are household names yep. in Japan and all over the world. Yep. Some of these guys have companies that are worth billions of dollars. Yep. So in a society that is set on following rules, it would sink anyone's career yes. if it was publicly known that they were associated with a criminal organization. They would go from being respected by the population to being viewed as an outlaw or a rebel which again is not cool in that society. Um, yeah, that'd be that would it would ruin their lives. So because of that, privacy is imperative in the group and mm -hmm. ultimately the most important thing for them. Which makes finding information on the team incredibly difficult. Communication with any Western media about the group results in an immediate excommunication from the group. Whew. There are members that will talk about their cars, but. Anyone brings up midnight, they're gonna shut you down. And even though they remain anonymous, their cars are legendary cars, such as the ABR Hosoki S130Z or the Yoshida Special Porsche 930 TBK Turbo. The Blackbird. The Blackbird. There's a freaking comic book <laughs> about this car, a manga, and many other amazing cars that would put even a modern day supercar to shame. They would race down the Tokyo highways at blistering speeds over 200 miles per hour for five to eight minutes at a time. That's so impressive. That's so long. And that's so much ground you're yeah. covering. <laughs> yeah, and they would do this multiple times a night, some, sometimes with as little as 10 minute intervals between runs, all without breakdowns or overheat. Yeah, because they're testing. They're, they're testing, not racing. They're not racing, they're, they're testing. testing the parts of the cars. That's And I mean, what you just read, that sound, that, I mean, that's testing. That's what that's it is. That's testing, yeah. That's what you do. And we're going to get into the cars and the driving next week in part two of the Midnight Club series. Uh, we'll be taking a deep look at some of these awesome, 
awesome cars involved in the club and some of the amazing thing that these tuners were able to accomplish. And as we stated in the beginning, the Wikipedia article that is used as a primary and only source in most articles was intentionally misleading to protect the identity of most of those involved. While some, of, while some information that we have may conflict with what information is generally shared, we can assure you mm -hmm. it's probably accurate. Yeah, we, look, we here, James and I, everyone else at Dylan Media, uh, we respect Team Midnight's desire to remain anonymous, and we'll be doing our best to uphold these expectations of privacy. Uh, I'm, I'm very proud mm -hmm. to be one of the only uh, English-speaking places with accurate Potentially accurate, accurate. Yeah, with potentially accurate on this club. Um, yeah, and tune in next yeah, week for next week. what we think is a message from the Midnight Club. Yeah. All right. I'm yeah. Nolan Sykes. Follow me on Instagram at Nolan J. Sykes. Follow James. At James Pumphrey. Follow, follow Donut. Donut on everything. Yep. At Donut Media. It's, a, it's a movement. Thanks for, thanks for listening. I love you. Love you. Hey, if you like listening to Pat... <laughs> If you like listening to podcasts, hey, if you like listening to podcasts <laughs> that's this one. Go down to the box and tell us, tells us so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're pretty new to this podcast thing, and uh, it really helps us out if you give us reviews and five star reviews. So five like, star reviews you like something. this. I mean, I think maybe four. I I would give this one. Yeah, a four. I think we're a four star. But right give now. us a five. Give us an give us an honest review. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> <laughs> give us just a good one. Okay. <laughs> I was listening to this podcast and I literally had to pull over because I was weeping. Nolan's voice is like velvet Whoa. and edible and mm. tasted like my mom's Thanksgiving. <laughs> Two stars. <laughs> Two stars. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Love you. Love Girls. you. Bye. Bye.